My name is Amy Starczewski, and I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History MA program here at Columbia. Um, tonight's event is the first in our year-long series, Exploring Oral History and Public Dialogue. Um, and so, uh, oral history conversations usually happen in a setting that feels very intimate, um, between two people um, intensely listening to each other and thinking about uh, one person's life story. But they're intended for a broader public audience. And so what we're going to be talking and thinking about throughout this year is how that translation happens between the private interview and the public audience. Um, and one of the ways we can see that most clearly is in a public interview that's actually performed, where that normally imaginary audience for the oral history is here um, actually listening in the moment. So I was so pleased that uh, Rob Snyder was willing to do this and to bring Laura Altshuler and Sixto Medina who's stuck in Pope traffic and is very close um, <laughs> to have a conversation with us tonight. Um, you know, I have known Rob Snyder for a very long time um, and last year I you know, saw that his new book was out and then I heard my students all talking about, oh, did you see Rob Snyder's talk in Washington Heights? Oh, did you read his book? Oh, did you see him speaking there? Did you see him speaking there? He was so wonderful. And there was a buzz, um, which is a really exciting thing for a new history book about New York City. Um, and so it's, I'm really glad that we're able to continue that conversation um, here on campus. More formally, um, Robert Snyder, who's going to be the moderator slash interviewer tonight, is an associate professor of journalism and American studies at Rutgers University, Newark, and a New York City resident. He grew up in the suburban town of Dumont, New Jersey, listening to his parents' stories about their old neighborhood of Washington Heights. Um, and I should mention that he's also been um, a friend and a part of this program since we determined earlier in 1974. Um, and so uh, we have had some very long-running conversations here about what oral history is and what the point of doing it is and how to do the best possible job, and particularly about the relationship between oral history and journalism, um, which is a question that has um, really driven our program since its inception in 1948. And Rob's been a really important part of those conversations. Um, he's going to be in conversation with Laura Altschuler, uh, who was born in Stuttgart, Germany in 1932, has been a resident of Washington Heights and Inwood since 1939. Uh, she was a public school parent and president or vice president of the parents' associations at PS 98, Junior High School 143, Bronx High School of Science, and the High School of Music and Art. In Upper Manhattan, she monitored voting in local school board elections. I noticed her pen to remind us all to vote. Um, she's moderated debates and lectured on civic issues in New York City and served on a variety of appointed boards. So I'll just mention that this uh, series is part of the Paul F. Lazarusfeld Lecture Series and it's also sponsored by Insight, which is our institutional home, the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics. Oh. He's here! Ah, he's here! Oh. <laughs> Come on, sit down. Thank you. Since uh, it's been years. <laughs> So, Sixto Medina was yes. born in Santiago, Dominican Republic in 1946. <laughs> Immigrated to New York City in 1963. From 1967 to 1998, he worked at the GM plant in North Terrytown, New York, where he was active in the rank and file committee of Local 664 of the United Auto Workers, which challenged both management and union leadership on conditions in the plant. We've got some fighters in the room. Uh, he also served on the local's executive board. As a resident and public school parent in Washington Heights, he became active in the Parents Association of PS 173. He was elected to one term on the local school board in 1980. He was also a Democratic district leader and founding member of both the Alianza Dominicana and the Tamboril Community Center in Washington Heights. Thank you both, Laura and Sixto, for coming out tonight. And thank you, Amy, for that really wonderful introduction. I just want to talk a little bit about oral history in this book and then bring it down to the issues that I engaged in the book and really the important role of both Laura and Sixto in the history of the neighborhood and in helping me to write this book because I could not have written this book without the stories they told me, the information they shared with me and really the legacy that both of them built in different ways and complementary ways in, in northern Manhattan in some very critical decades. This book had a very long gestation period um, 
it stretches the definitions of oral history in some ways because it begins with stories that my parents told me in the 60s and 70s about our old neighborhood, Washington Heights in northern Manhattan, which they described as the ideal home for working people like themselves. Affordable apartments, great subway connections, uh, beautiful parks. It always made me feel like somehow, although we were living in New Jersey, we were meant to be living in northern Manhattan, and that it was in some sense almost the old country for me, this imaginary place on the other side of the river that was also real in some way that I could visit, and that I was always calibrating the differences between the life that I had in North Jersey in the suburbs, the life we might have had if we lived in Washington Heights. The book really took off. I really now see, in retrospect, when I cook, took a course with Ron Greeley, it was 1980 or 1981 in graduate school in history at NYU. Ron came to teach a course in oral history and, you know, being sort of monolingual, deficiently so, you know, like most American historians, even as a graduate student, I said, where will I go to do interviews? Well, I'll interview people who speak English. Irish Americans speak English. I'm interested in Irish folk music and I'll go to northern Manhattan and I'll find these elderly Irish people who are living there. And what fascinated me was I interviewed a lot of elderly Irish Americans. They were aware that their neighborhood was changing. They weren't always comfortable with it sometimes. They felt that they were they couldn't speak to their new neighborhoods and as, a, as very talkative people, I could sense that sort of rattled them sometimes. Um, at the same time, they described their neighborhood as a place where they're was very little conflict between ethnic groups in the past, and this was a new new departure in northern Manhattan. They were wrong about that. Uh, in the research that I did for Ron's course, it became really clear to me that ethnic conflict and racial conflict were an old theme in Washington Heights that went back to the 30s and 40s. So too were boundary lines in the neighborhood. I was fascinated to hear the metaphors that people would use for Broadway. They would describe Broadway as a no man's land. They would describe Broadway as a Berlin Wall. And what they meant was that in different generations and in different times, Broadway was a boundary, once between white and black, then between Irish and Jewish, then between Dominican born and American born, then between more and less affluent. The western side of the Broadway was the more affluent side of the neighborhood. The second thing I learned, though, in those interviews, aside from the way people used all sorts of metaphors to work with the landscape of their neighborhood to make sense of it, was how their own sense of who lived in their neighborhood could be wildly at odds with reality. The elderly Irish Americans I interviewed in Ron's course told me again and again, the neighborhood was all Irish. Everybody was Irish in Washington Heights and Inwood. And then I looked at a census. And at no point was any part of Washington Heights up until the 80s ever more than a fifth or at most a quarter Irish. So how did people living in a neighborhood where the Irish were actually statistically a minority think of themselves as living in an all Irish neighborhood? This to me was a puzzle I had to solve. And I found out they lived in buildings mostly inhabited with, by other Irish people. They belonged to Roman Catholic parishes um, with other Irish people. They tended to work sometimes in city agencies, police department, fire department with other Irish Americans. So their lives were organized to live with other Irish Americans. And they were not unusual in that. I want to make that really clear. Greek, Jewish, Irish, and later Dominican residents tended to replicate that pattern. And they lived in enclaves. They could often get along with each other in heterogeneous groupings on their block, on the street corner. But once you got beyond the familiar world of your block and familiar faces, everyone, I think, felt they were in strange territory. And they didn't know always what to make of that. I did more interviews in the neighborhood in 1989 and 1990 um, for a, a project at the Media Studies Center, then at Columbia, here at Columbia, over in the Journalism School building. I was trying to study the media coverage of the crack epidemic. I interviewed a lot of residents. I interviewed police officers. I interviewed Dominican residents and Irish and Jewish residents. I also interviewed the editor of a local newspaper. And at the end of the project, frankly, I was kind of sad and depressed. I saw in, by, in the early 90s no, no possible better future for Washington Heights and Inwood. The neighborhood was in the grip of a crack epidemic that drove murders to extraordinary heights. Poverty was growing. I didn't see how it was going to change in any remarkable way anytime soon. That made me really sad. And I did not want to write a sad book. 
about my parents' old neighborhood that they loved so much. And I, I set aside the idea of writing a book about Washington Heights and Inwood. And I wrote instead an essay that in a book called The New York Irish about the Irish of Washington Heights and Inwood from the 40s to the present. But I put the book aside. I really didn't want to do anything about the neighborhood. And then in 2003, I ran into a friend from Washington Heights, a woman named Regina Gradess, and she said to me, you know, Rob, things have changed a lot in the last decade. You should really come back up here. I said, what's going on? She goes, well, you know, one, it's a lot safer than it used to be. Um, there's a newspaper in the neighborhood. It fights for the neighborhood. Um, most of the neighborhood newspapers in the past were like fearful, badly written, and intended to make people think the only thing they had ahead of them was a catastrophe. I also um, walked around the neighborhood, went to an Immigrant Heritage Day at the Y on Nagel Avenue, and was really pleased to see that different ethnic groups seemed to be enjoying sharing their stories. I, in 2004, I ran in a 5K race sponsored by Coogan's, and I came home at the end of the race, and I said to my wife, you know, all these ethnic groups that I remember fighting so much in the 90s, they're getting along, at least for a day, maybe just a day, but they seem to be getting along. Maybe something is going on here. And so I went to work to try to understand how the neighborhood got from the years of high crime and crack in the early 90s to this obvious recovery by 2003. Who deserved credit? What were the strengths and limits of that recovery? And, and, and did it have any larger lesson for the city as a whole? I wanted to create a narrative that got to the changes in the neighborhood that were not observed in newspaper headlines. Oral history was critical for that. I read practically everything written about the neighborhood from the 60s to the 90s, but that didn't tell the whole story. I also used a lot of municipal records and a lot of census records. In part, the census records gave me a big demographic story. In the 70s and 80s, Washington Heights became a Latino majority neighborhood. It also became economically a poorer neighborhood. Down to 1970, it had been dominated by European immigrants and their children, and it had been solidly middle class and working class. That changed by the 1990s. I also wanted to get the stories of individuals who had helped the neighborhood recover in these very difficult years. And I knew that if I was going to do that, I was going to have to look in new directions. And that led me to do a lot more oral histories. I discovered fairly quickly that schools were in the middle of some of the most contentious political fights in Washington Heights. In that, it's not unique. That's true of a lot of New York City neighborhoods in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And it's a re-emerging issue today when we people talk about racial integration and the schools. But schools were so contentious for a couple reasons. One, in most people's minds, the zones that define the public school catchment area, the area in which students would go to a given public school or a school district, those were community boundary lines. Those were the real definition of your community. Whereas your community, in many people's heads, your community was where your child went to school. Never mind that the boundary lines for schools and school districts could be worked on in ways that sort of you know, render, render almost meaningless the distinction between de facto segregation and de jure segregation. Okay? Schools were in the middle of that fight um, and the middle of the definition of what it meant to live in a, in a particular neighborhood. The second thing I saw was that, and I was not alone in this, was that the community control era in New York City's public schools was an important era in the history of the city. That the idea of devolving power to community level districts that would run their own schools had been important, had been the product of more than a decade of incredible ferment about what to do with public education in New York City. And Ira Katz Nelson had written an important book about this that I read and studied a lot. So that schools were important for community definition, schools were important for community empowerment. And then it became obvious to me, as I studied the Dominican experience in Washington Heights, that the schools were also an important place 
and the elected boards around the schools are also an important place for thrashing out the Dominican arrival in the neighborhood and Dominican empowerment in the neighborhood. My interest in schools led me to both Laura Altshuler and Sixto Medina. I first came across Sixto um, when he was in the United Auto Workers local at the GM plant in Tarrytown. I covered auto workers local as part of my duties as a local reporter. I never met him, but his, his name made a, an impression on me. I would see it. Um, and then, looking through some obscure pile of papers somewhere in my research, I came across a memo by Laura Altshuler in which she said that Sixto Medina is a good bridge builder. He's a person who's really to be encouraged. And I said, wait a minute, could this be the same guy that I encountered when he was in the auto workers union? And so I started getting in touch with both of them. Um, I actually never did a full-length interview with Laura, but she shared insights with me, um, looked at a chapter of the book for me to see if it seemed to be accurate, and um, you know, sent me a pile of newspaper clippings, which testified to all the hell she raised, basically, <laughs> around all sorts of issues in, in Washington Heights years before. I met Sixto for a drink. The idea was we'd have a drink, we'd just say hello, then I'd come back for an interview. I sort of felt that once I talked to him for 10 minutes, this was one of the most interesting people I had ever met. I needed to talk to him for a long time. And you know, two hours later, that, that interview ended with me furiously taking notes. And he really impressed upon me the importance, I think, of Dominican leftists in shaping the character of Washington Heights politically in the years from the 70s on. I came to conclude that it was the activism of people like Laura and Sixto, sometimes working in concert, sometimes not even aware of each other's efforts, but these ground up efforts, bottom up efforts, played a much larger role in helping the neighborhood navigate the years of the urban crisis than I had realized. That said, I think local efforts also played a role in improving housing stock, and Joel Rothschild in the front row played a big role in that, and I interviewed him about that. They also played a big role in reducing crime and pushing the police to improve relations with the community. But that the schools issue in many ways was the most volatile issue. It involved definitions of community. It involved discussions of what schooling was for in a democratic society. It involved who parents were willing to send their children to school with. And these were all very, very contentious issues then and now in Washington Heights. And so I want to really now move over and just start asking some questions of Laura and six, though, to get us started. And just to put you both in context, maybe, Laura, could you just start by telling us where you grew up? I arrived in Washington Heights in 39. And uh, at that point, uh, our first apartment was on the east side of Broadway. And it was lovely, with a beautiful view of Fort Ryan Park and the cloisters, so it from our living room window. And uh, I attended all the schools um, in Washington Heights, uh, 189. Uh, then girls couldn't be with boys in George Washington High School the first year and a half. In retrospect, probably not a bad idea, because <laughs> this was the time when the boys are so smart in math and science. And so we went to the top floor of uh, PS, um, 98 in Inwood and uh, we got the top floor and uh, caged in roof garden for, for outdoor activities because this was before Title IX but we were permitted you know to get into the sports and um, it was marvelous uh, we're there with all my friends and then after the first year and a half moved to George Washington High School and had pro probably the most superb teachers and experiences there uh, and went on uh, to college and uh, by, by that time after a few years we were living on Fort Washington Avenue and then when um, uh, I got married we moved uh, back to very near 189 right I don't know if you're familiar with Upper Manhattan it's uh, where um, the yeshiva is and Laurel Hill Terrace and um, uh, so we had our first apartment there, and then when uh, our second child was born, we 
moved to Inwood and had a very nice apartment up there. So for a good part of the section where you write all the problems with the schools, you know, particularly, you know, 187, I escaped that, which gave me, I think, a different perspective. I didn't realize it until I, you know, kind of read it in the book because I got it very involved with Inwood and I think I was always involved in all my school days and everything I did because it was just fun. Uh, for example, in that first year and a half, I was editor of the Cherry Branch. For those of you who might know George Washington High School, the name of the school newspaper is the Cherry Tree. So they let us because we were, you know, that the women, they let us. Uh, a separate newspaper. Yeah, well, but, but we called it the Cherry Branch because we were, you know, like, yeah, right. Uh, and, um, but when you, when you start writing about something or editing other people's work, you just get a different perspective. And I think what I learned from it without being aware of it is just being interested in absolutely everything. And uh, I had a lot more energy then too, which is good. Uh, and then when my son was going to start kindergarten, that was probably 67, 68. When was Ocean Hill Brownsville? Yeah, 68. Yeah, 68, right. And so there we had a teacher strike. I mean, it's a, and so you had to get involved because there had to be something to deal with. And, um, but my first form of real activism, the strike was eventually settled. The kids all went back to school and I would wheel my daughter in her stroller up to 98 and wait in the indoor yard, whatever they called it, uh, for these half-day kids to come out. And I observed two lines going to the lunchroom. And it was very obvious to me that the one line looked very white and the other line was a mixture. And I eventually asked one of the school monitors, why are there two lines for the lunchroom? My kid wasn't, you know, he just had half a day. And they said, those are the free lunch kids and these are, you know, the ones who pay. And they paid, I guess, I found out later, the teacher collected it they should let teachers teach, for heaven's sake, and not collect lunch money, but that's a different story. And uh, I just came home and told my husband and told my parents and told my friends, what kind of nonsense is that? Uh, and so I asked to speak to the assistant principal. I think her name was Sheila Konigsberg. Yeah. And she said, well, it just has to be done that way because Otherwise, how would you know? And I said, why do you need to know? <laughs> I said, it's not the child's fault. And then they said, you'll have to speak to Harry Rothman. God, it's, you know, if you wait a while, the names come back. He was the principal of PS98 and a gentleman of the old school and very polite. And uh, he listened to me. And he gave me the same reason that the city requires it, there's bookkeeping involved. And I said, well, I think you're setting a, a terrible principle. And that um, I think I could figure out for you how to do it so it's less work for teachers and everyone else. And so then he said, well, go do it. And I got a few parents together and we devised a plan. And within around six months, it took six months, which is pretty good, right? And that. They, the payment was taken care of by some kind of school secretary and there was one line. So by the time my son was in first grade, there was one line. So that was, I thought, was a very nice success. But this was, of course, also the time of then decentralization. And we got a very good group together. Uh, I have very good friends. Uh, you, you remember Sisto Tom Marino? Yeah. He was on the slate, so yeah. we, got, we got our Irish Catholics. Well, I know Marino, Italian, but the rest of the family's all Irish. And uh, we had Sisto, and we had Gwen Crenshaw, et cetera. So when we started working on 
getting a slate to re really represent at least our community, we also read, I guess I read it, that we could select our principals. And I thought that Harry Rothman was a, you know, probably an honest guy, but I shouldn't be talking about it, but too old, look at me. So, <laughs> but I was, I was polite. Uh, and I said, um, we've got to pick a principal. We've got to change the school. We have to, uh, this was the time of Lillian Weber. And so, and we did. We just went barreling ahead, and within approximately two years, we, uh, we got um, Harry Rothman out. It was time to retire. And I didn't let anybody, in my hearing, say nasty things about him, because I just think he didn't know. Uh, we were a uh, new world, and we hired Mark Shapiro. And he was fabulous. He was a fabulous principal. He, we set up the school. One third regular school, one third um, bilingual, but really bilingual. You had to accept uh, Spanish speaking and English so that the courses would be bilingual. And one was open admissions, uh, that type of feeling. No, what did she call it? What did Lillian Weber? Open? Open admissions. No, not open admissions, open, open classrooms. Open classrooms. Open classrooms. Open classrooms? Open classrooms, right. And, um, and so and some switched in between. But with that kind of, and it did happen very rarely, but we had such, we had really strong people involved. It was a time <coughs> where if a woman could and had the financial choice to do so, She did not have to work. And I had a very good job, and I liked my job, but I liked being a mother, and I could handle it. And I think there was an advantage in all those years um, that there was a real parent presence, much more than it's possible to do so now, for all kinds of reasons. And uh, so that was the beginning of my being an activist. Okay. Let's get Sixto. Sixto, why don't you start by describing where you grew up Oh, yes, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I'm very happy. I really feel like I'm going to enjoy the, this, this moment. Thank you for making it possible for me to be here and to everybody else. Thank you. Uh, well, I was born in Santiago, Dominican Republic, uh, to a, a poor family. My father was a carpenter, carver, very good carver, wood carver, and my mother was a homemaker. Uh, my father was half black, and my mother was uh, uh, Spanish, uh, from a daughter to a Spanish immigrant, a Spaniard. And uh, they met, uh, I guess, um, I lived uh, the last 25 years of my mother's life, I spent it taking care of her, and we have a beautiful uh, experience. Uh, I learned so much about her, and she learned, and I learned about myself and my family and the past. And those are, are years that I could not ever forget. It's the best thing that I have ever done in my life. Just to spend 25 years of my life dealing with my mom. Aside from dealing with all her impatience and, and everything else <laughs> during her the last few, few years of her life. So, um, but I was very aware of what was going on in my life. Um, I knew very early very early on, one of the things my mother used to tell me is, how can you remember that? You're only one year old. And I did remember. I remember things that and I would tell her, she said, you cannot remember that. And I said, yes, I remember that. I remember I would took a machete and I was hitting the, the uh, piece of wood, the, tr the tree trunk, and the big worms were coming out of the, of the tree, tree trunk and I was trying to pick it out. And they tried to scare me. I said, I'm not scared. And I stopped chopping. Continued to shop the, uh, the the tree trunk, and um, I was very uh, determined to to kill the uh, the worm, the big worms. Uh, so, but I live a very diverse life, thankfully, um, because uh, three, uh, soon after I I was born, 
my mother moved from Santiago. Well, actually, my mother, we, we had a, my mother's side of the family was kind of rich. They have a lot of land in Moca, which is a, another city close to Santiago. And they, all, they were farmers and landowners. But that richness never reached to us. Uh, we were not um, privileged to that, to that uh, richness. Um, but we had, we, my, my aunt and my grandmother had land, and eventually they lost everything. But anyway, we have my, my aunt, uh, my grandmother's uh, sister, she was a beautiful lady and she allowed oh, we will come to visit her and she was she was so welcoming to the kids to all of us and uh we have very good uh dreams and their very good history and experience with her and we still t today talk about her so my experience with her was that i live in a little uh, hamlet or called montelajagua near moca um, a very agricultural, one of the best agricultural part of the Dominican Republic in the Valley of Cibao. Uh, so from there, then I moved around a lot because my mother divorced eventually during that time. I, I was about, I guess about two years old. I never saw my father for too long. I don't remember seeing my father when I, when I was one year old. So my father disappeared from my life and um, of course, I didn't ask for my father because I didn't know that I had a father. But eventually, one day, my father showed up. A few years later, I was about, I guess, three or four years old. And I recognized him. I, I knew his face. And uh, then I learned the story that he was in jail. He was locked up because he was political activity in the uh, Dominican Republic. And so, as you all probably understand, the Dominican Republic was under the dictatorship of Trujillo from 1930 to 1960, 31 years, 30, 31 years. So I was born during the, uh, the dictatorship and everything that we did was uh, uh, clearly demarca demarcated by, by the political climate and the social and also the religious uh, uh, climate that we lived in by the Catholic Church. Uh, so from there, my mother moved to, um, my aunt Maria moved to Monte Cristi, which is a, a um, very arid, uh, very uh, small city by, by near Haiti, about 10 kilometers from Haiti. And uh, near Monte Cristi, there was a banana plantation uh, from the banana fruit, uh, United Fruit. And so there was a lot of people from different parts of the country who, uh, congregated and came to look for a job and they got jobs there. And I went up there because my mother, my aunt's uh, husband, my uncle, uh, who was looking for a job, he went to look for a job there and he worked there. So my mother followed her to that part of the world. Uh, so I was, I was exposed to, to the, the American kind of uh, discipline in, in some way, because it, it was kind of a very structural life. Uh, uh, so everybody had their own, got their own house free. They, own, they, they, they were assigned a house free. Uh, there was all the, a lot of good things that they got a job, they, they worked very hard. So my mother decided that, so my mother and my father obviously, because he disappeared during the, uh, his jail time up in San Cristobal somewhere. Um, he, he, they sort of uh, they got separated and divorced. Well, they never divorced legally, but I, I found out when I was coming here that they were not divorced, so they had to get through the uh, legal proceeding to, to get an actual divorce. So then I lived in, in Monte Cristi for a long time. But what happened is, was that my mother he got, in, got together with another another guy, also named Carlos. My name, my father's name was Carlos, and this other guy was Carlos. And so I lived with them, and uh, I didn't like the guy, and I guess he didn't like me. 
but anyway, we spend a lot of time together in, the, in that kind of environment. Uh, eventually, he was liquidated. Liquidated is like when you do a release from the company. We call him liquidator over there. I don't know why. He was released from the company for whatever reason, so they had to move out and relinquish the house and everything else. And so my mother, there was a lady in town, the wife of a, a foreman, a black lady, and the foreman was white, is her husband. It was not her husband, it was just a common arrangement. Um, um, so my mother decided that during the time she was living there, she, she decided that in order to make some money, she would cook for the, uh, the workers. Uh, a lot of the workers were single people, single guy, mo mostly men, obviously, all of the men, not mostly, all of the men. And they were single because they left their hometown to come to work. So they left, if they were, if they were married, they left the family behind. And then if they were single, they would just um, uh, live by themselves. So they, my mother decided to create like a restaurant type of thing and provide food to people who were willing to pay for it at noon time. Uh, because we eat at the big meal at 12 o'clock. Everybody eats, it used to be the, uh, that we have big meal at 12 o'clock. So obviously my mother then decided that she was gonna expand the business and our job was to bring, bring the canteen, we call it canteen, uh, it's like a military type of uh, different pots together and they were, um, put together through a wire, and you have the meat, the rice, the beans, and so forth and so on, all in one container. And our job was to deliver this food to these people, or to the rich people, the, the, uh, the administration people who live in the, in the neighborhood. And in that process, I met Maria Gabo, Maria, and, uh, this black lady, and she was kind of um, isolated from the community, I learned, I, I saw that, and I learned that as, as I grew up. Uh, and Gabo was white. He was a, most of the people who worked in the company were ex-military, uh, part of the dictatorship. For some reason, they, they either quit the, uh, the army or, or the police, and they, they, they all each helped each other, and they took over this company, and they all worked in this company. Everybody knew each other. All the big bosses knew each other. I can tell you all the names. And, and they, they, they have military rank at some point or another. So they, the company hired all these ex-military people for various reasons. Number one, for the discipline, and for the two, because they, they kept control of the population or the workers from organizing as a, for a union uh, to organize. And whenever somebody, I remember one guy who tried to organize, they disappeared. Uh, I learned that when I was about when 1960. But anyway, so that experience, so I met Maria, and Maria uh, wanted to have, so I have Carlos, my mother's uh, uh, husband. Um, I had three kids, three boys, and I was happy because we, we enjoyed ourselves. We went into the banana fields, and we ate banana, and everything grows in the Dominican Republic, I mean everything. Uh, you don't go hungry in, in the country. And we ate everything. We brought everything that we could find, uh, eggs, uh, um, bananas, and everything else, and uh, eggplants. That, that everything grows wild, you know. So we had a lot of fun. But one of the things that we did was at noon time we had to do this this task of distributing this food. So Maria decided that she talked to us and she said, I want, she didn't have, she didn't have any kids. And she said, I want to have a kid. She talked to all three of us, all four of us. And so we look at each other and, and we say, oh, not me. No, neither of us wanted to be a son. So, so eventually uh, she, Maria and my mother, her name was Estrella, my mother's name was Estrella, uh, middle name, but she was called Estrella by everyone. So my mother Estrella and Maria became very close friends because when Maria used to come to pay her every week, they would sit down and they talk, they drink coffee and they talk. 
So Maria convinced my mother that she that she wanted one of us to live with her. And bottom line is that at uh, one point, Carlos, my mother's husband, beat her up or something. Um, and he used to beat her up occasionally. Uh, and my mother decided that she was going to move out of the house that she was living. So my father, my stepfather, my father, Gabo, who was, I was living, then I moved, okay. So Gabo, Maria's husband, was a foreman, and he had some kind of overall control over the, the hamlet. There was about, I guess it would be about 150 people living in the hamlet. It was very square, a big ball field in the middle, in the center, and a barrack for the older single men all the way in the back and we were surrounded by bananas all over the place. And a lot of pipes and a lot of trucks and, and a train, a big cargo train. So um, at that point, we, Maria and Estrella became very good friends and during that incident when my mother got beat up by her husband, uh, she, Maria negotiated with uh, Gabo, his name was Gabo, G O B A G A B O T. Uh, he was French. He was uh, related to. He was descendant from the from the French. Uh, so he, very tall, and lanky, and good-looking guy. So he, he was the one who controlled the keys for all the houses, and and he also wore wore a big knife. That was his con control mechanism. And so everybody respected and was fearful of him. And uh, so he uh, provided a house right across from Maria, empty house for my mother, but for herself and the kids. So at that point, they became very close. They became comadres. Comadre is a, is a Catholic or, uh, um, um, relationship that uh, that you now you you, uh, you baptize the child somebody else's child you become the commander. Right, parents. Yeah. Why do I know that? So uh, so they they became comadres uh, because Maria baptized my little sister Purita. So they they really very close. I mean, you talk about a white. My mother was white, pitch white, and this woman was black. And not only she was black, he was kind of rejected from the whole town around her. And my mother was very simple, very friendly uh, woman. And, you know, she didn't, there was no animosity or no feelings of, about anything about her towards Maria. So they became very close. They, they would talk about their personal things, personal problems, their personal history. And I know that then, but I also found that out later on during the 25 years that I spent with my mother all the, the lot of the details. So bottom line is I, end, I ended, up, then ended up living with Maria for 12 years because my mother then disappeared from the scene and went back to Santiago, my hometown, with this guy, Carlos. And at this time, they already had uh, two kids, two of my sister, and in Santiago, they had another three more, three or four more. How did you come to New York from this? How did you... Well, okay. Before I went to Monte Cristi, to that setting that I just described, my aunt uh, was a very uh, aggressive woman. She knew what she wanted, and, and what she wanted, she got. And uh, she was very uh, energized. She was very, she had a very open, uh, she had a very open understanding of what she was going to be what her future was going to be. And she laid out her, her, her mission. Uh, and then she decided that she was going to challenge the government and seek a visa to the United States. That was in 1950, 1950. Mm -hmm. So she got a visa against the, uh, everybody who told her not to do it. Because at that time, before you, before you uh, if you want to get out of the country, um, uh, the government had to find out who your relatives are, uh, the people who are actively involved against the government, to identify, create a track record who were you connected with. Uh, because uh, if you understand the, how the government uh, functioned then, 
was that Trujillo would, uh, people who own land, Trujillo would go to their town or the area, and if he likes the land that they have, or the product that they have, they have to give it to him free. They, they could not, they would not be, they would not be allowed to, to charge the government. If Trujillo wants uh, the landowner's daughter, he will also want the daughter, and he will take the daughter, or the wife, or the cousin, or the nephew, whatever. Everybody, they, they, they take the nephew and put him in the army, and they take the girl from the nephew and then and, and, and ship him out to the capital, and uh, the girl will disappear up there somewhere, uh, being raped by, by the government people. But anyway, so my aunt, said that she did not want to be a victim of the, of the Trujillo. So she, she was a Vasquez for my, my, my mother's uh, mother from, from Moca. The Vasquez family had a reputation of being very stubborn and also not very um, coward. They're very, they stood up for themselves. And they also had a lot of land. My uncle had a lot of, a lot of land in Montelagua. And so Trujillo came one day, and something happened that Trujillo wants his uh, wood. He's got all the trees for the, for, the, for the army. And my uncle told him not to, that he's not gonna give it to him. So, so before the army came to take the wood, uh, my uncle had his workers cut down all the trees and just give it to all the, the whole, uh, all the people in the community. He told him, come over here and get whatever you want. I don't want the government to. So Trujillo heard about this, or his people learned about it. Because Trujillo had spies all over the place. I mean, there was, there was, I grew up to, in that area, I remember. They have, the person next door could, could have been his spy, our spy in the neighborhood. So at that point, uh, my, my uncle got in trouble. And uh, so they connected my, my aunt to him because she was born in Mocha. And he said, oh, you are a relative of uh, so-and-so Vasquez. She said, yes, that's my uncle. And then, of course, uh, she had to beg, and I don't know what else happened, but she eventually got permission to, to get a visa to apply for a passport. And she got it. And she left. She said, I'll never come back to this country. Uh, How did you come to leave? Well, then that's the beginning of the chain. What year was this? That's 1950. 1950. 1950. So I was four years old then, and I remember the first, in fact, I was going to bring a picture of my, the last picture that my, my aunt took when she left the country. She took us out to the park and took a picture of us and said, I want to take these pictures because I don't know when I'm going to see you again. And my aunt lived until 10 years ago. She was a great uh, inspiration to all of us. And um, so, obviously, after that, my sister came in 1958, my older sister. I was I am the second child, and I was living with Maria then, back in in in, in Tomonte Cristi, you know, in the company, the banana company, until 1958. And by that time, I was traveling back and forth. I, it was very unstable. I lived a very unstable life because at one point I, I, wanted, I didn't want to live with Maria. I wanted to live with my mother, but my mother was dealing with her, with her husband problem, and I really didn't. I hated him, and, and I, he hated me, of course, for the obvious reason because I could see what was going on in between them. And uh, every time I went there to see my mother, I, I, I called Maria and said, I want to come back and Maria would take me. Uh, but uh, the basis of my diverse uh, mentality is the fact that I was exposed to all these things. And I captured it, all the, I captured all the, the essence of that, those uh, debate, those uh, conflicts. And I tried to make sense of them. I think the religion also makes me uh, also think a little bit about, I prayed a lot uh, because there was nothing else. And there was nothing else. So I came to the United States in 1963 because it was preconditioned, it was predetermined that I was going to come here. Uh, I wasn't too excited about it because I knew it was going to be a, a done deal, 
but I was I was living with Maria. Then Maria uh, Gabo was uh, also released from the company. Uh, the, 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 at that time, the business was whittling down. The banana uh, plantation, the business was doing that, and they eventually closed the, the whole plantation. And so they came to live in Santiago. So I went to live with them again, and they set up a nice restaurant in Santiago, and we were very successful there. I worked with them until I was uh, I was seventeen. And you came to New York City in sixty. Yeah, sixty four. I landed in Idlewild Airport. Do you know anybody knows why they're walking? The JFK. Yeah. JFK. Yeah. You went to work in factories, right? Yes, I worked. Um, so uh, I came to uh, Jackson Heights, 7535 15 Leverage Street, 35th Avenue. And there was, a, there was a lot of factory around there, and it was not difficult to find a job at that time. You can just walk out and you find a job. There's no so easy. And my mother says, okay, so I come to New York and the reason I didn't come to, come to New York because I feel that I've been working all my life at that point. That I haven't had a really a childhood, a normal childhood, so to speak. Because Maria won't let me hang out with my friends. She always kept me away from everybody. She, she was a little bit isolated. She wanted me to be isolated. And I refused. So anyway, we have problems with her. I used to get beat up because of that, because I, was, I used to escape out and, and go and hang out with the kids. But uh, I went to school, and the teacher actually was Gabo's niece, beautiful woman, and and she and she was um, she was my first grade teacher, Milagros, and uh, she would travel from Montecriti every day to come to the to the hamlet, to to a day, Maguaca, to to teach every day, and she would eat in my house. So I had to behave. I had no choice. Um, when we when we talked about in our interview, you talked a lot about how you were working in the factory. Then you were in job corps yeah. for a while. Yeah. And then well, you came to Washington Heights. How did you get to Washington well, Heights? Well, then I, I came to. Uh, well, you know, I was dependent on my mother. I mean, my mother was my leader. She she was she came in a year before me in 1962. So the you you gotta understand, we had a mission. Our mission was to to go to work and to make money and to uh, bring everybody else who was left behind. So all the kids, all my sisters were behind, was left behind. So my mother was very centered, and you know, obviously she was a mother, a good mother. And she was very dedicated to make sure that everybody went to work. And when we came home from the factory, we had to give her the check, and she gave me two dollars. <laughs> but believe me, I bought a lot of stuff for two dollars. <laughs> because the movies house was 15 cents. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the, the, the cheap movies and other stuff. Anyway, but, uh, but soon, soon enough, uh, then all my sister came. They, by, 19, by the time the World's Fair was, uh, What's going on up in uh, in uh, Flushing? Uh, 1965, 64, 65. Yeah, they 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 already they were already here. Um, so naturally, I am I I I was a fifth grade uh, educated, fifth grade level, badly educated, because at that time, when Trujillo was assassinated, then there was a many conflicts. Everybody wanted to be president, everybody wanted to take control of the thing, the government, and the gen all the generals, there was a general, uh, there was a president like three times, and, and Balaguer, Joaquin Balaguer, who was a, a uh, the, the, my, the teacher, my Trujillo's teacher, uh, who was the, uh, the, uh, the intelligent guy next to Trujillo, he was a, wanted to be uh, president. President, and so there was a lot of conflict because Balaguer was out of the country, and then when he came back, uh, everybody wanted to make sure that he didn't get elected, and everybody wanted to get be elected. So there was every three months they closed the school, were closed. Uh, there was no class. There was fighting, shooting in the street. Um, I witnessed people being shot in the street. Um, and uh, there was a lot of riot, and eventually, uh, 
uh, Juan Bosch got elected president, the best president that we ever had. 1960, December, December 21st, I think, 23rd, 1962, he got elected president. And 63, I left to the United States um, in, in September, September 1st, September, August 29, I left. And I ran here from Puerto Rico. So, so when we came here, so we, we went to work and our mission was to work and make money to bring the rest of it. So my mother decided that she wanted to move back to, to Manhattan. And I didn't really like Manhattan at all, because I love the idea of living in all these little houses in Washington, in Jackson Heights. Right. I love this whole notion of, um, so, so we moved to Washington Heights, 177, by Amsterdam Avenue. And a little apartment that was uh, the size of anybody's kitchen right now. And we live one on top of the other. And uh, I have five sisters, no, six sisters. They were all living together. I was the only man in the family. I'm the only boy in the whole family. Um, so most of all working, and my, girl, my sisters were going to a PS 115, and, um, and eventually we moved to uh, a 107 Wadsworth. And from there we went to 91 for Washington. And by the, by the time I went to, we went to 107 for uh, Wadsworth, then I was already working. And so I went find a job in the factory right near my house. So I didn't have to take the train or anything like that. The factory burned out two months later. Uh, I collected unemployment like $20 a week. And then I, my mother says, you're not going to collect, you're not, you're not here to collect unemployment. You got to go to work. So I had to get up the next day and go to, and find a job. So I found a job at the Monarch Luggage Company on 25th Street. 20, uh, they had two factories, one on 26th and one on 25th. And I worked there. It was very hot. I didn't like the environment. It was I was I was uh, a lot of things were going through my mind about what my future is going to be. I was very aware. One of the things about one of the, my virtue, I guess, is that I was very aware what my mission was in life. I wanted to have, I, I, would have, I had the vision that I had to be, I had to influence what I was going to be. I could not let somebody else decide it who, who was going to be. So I, I decided that I, that I was not a school material and during that time. And then when I went to work for North Monarch, uh, taking the train, the A train from 176 to 26th Street, 23rd, it was so hot, and the condition was so bad that I said, "No, this is not what I, this is not what I'm looking for in this New York. This is New York. I got to do better than this." So I tried to join the army um, because I felt that if I if I joined the army, I would learn English, and I also well at that point I decided that I had to learn English. There was no, no there was no way about it. There's no two way about it. I had to learn English. And so I took all the newspaper I could find. I didn't watch Spanish television, only in one channel, uh, uh, Spanish, and two radio stations. But I didn't want to hear no radio station. I picked up the newspaper from the guys next to me at work, and I read the daily news and read all, as much as I could. And I, I, I knew a little bit because before I come here, I came here. I went to, to get some personal uh, teaching. Somebody, uh, I paid for somebody to teach me a little English, and I, I knew a little bit. So I decided that I was going mm -hmm. to join the Army. And my mother said, no, you're not joining the Army because I'm not going to lose you. You're the only man I have in my life. And uh, if you go to the Army, you're going to go to Vietnam. And of course, I didn't listen to my mother. I didn't care what she said. I, it was all about me. And I went and registered for the serve, selective service, and I was disqualified, 4F. My classification was 4F, was disqualified. And I was very sad, and I didn't know what to do. So during this process, you know, when you go to this office, they have little coupon cards all over the place, announcement and advertisement. So I pull out a, a thing from the job court. I fill it out. 
and I used to fill out everything. I was, I just, I, I was, I wanted to be involved in something, but I didn't. I, I wanted to move forward. I didn't know where, but I wanted to move somewhere. And so I fill out a bunch of cards, and uh, I forgot all about it. And a few months later, uh, they they send me something, and they say yes. Oh, and then I was working at 25th Street, and my mother called me. And you never get a phone call at work at that time. If you get a phone call from your family at work, somebody's dead. And Howard, my foreman, tell me, there's a phone call for you. For me? I said, Shh. I said, something happened. So I went to the phone, my mother was hysterical. I said, what's going on? What happened? Que pasa? Oh, there's some people here calling you that you need to be in Queens on 108th Street, and you got a sanction paper because you've been shipped out. And she they said, and I told you not to join the army, and then she chastised me, she said, and she's crying. She said, you gotta come back over here, and you gotta get dressed, and you gotta get. So by the time I got home, so Howard, my former says, what's going on? He said, I'm quitting, I'm going, I'm leaving, bye. He says, uh, what, what, why? I said, I'm going to school. So then she was able to tell him it was a job board. And I said, okay, yes. And I said, uh, I'm leaving, going to school. He said, what, do you want to raise? I said, I don't want to raise, I want to go to school. He said, come on, let's talk. I said, no, I'm not talking, send my check home. So, so I, I came home, I came home to, watch, to, uh, to Washington High, to, 100, to 107, 5F. And, and my mother, by that time, she already had a little suitcase, and she went to the store right next, around the corner in St. Nicholas, she bought me some new clothes, and I took a shower and put my jacket on and left to Queens, took the train, said goodbye to her, and oh my gosh, she, she was sad. I was sad too, but I was happy. I was <laughs> really excited. Let me, let me cut back to Laura for a minute, because at the same time that this is going on in your life, she is working to do important things in the school district that you're going to come back to very shortly, yes. okay? Uh, what did you think was at stake in the community control experiment, which takes off by the end of the 60s and gives the neighborhood control over the schools? Right. Well, I think, um, by and large, it was given a bad rap. And um, while at the beginning, the UFT was almost unilaterally opposed, it turned out later uh, as teachers were certainly permitted to run to serve on the school boards, and many did, and very successfully. And um, just as there were mainly, when I was growing up, parent-teachers associations, and then later there were just parents' associations, and I believe that happened after the teacher strike because there was uh, conflict going on. But again, not everywhere. Uh, interestingly enough, I think Queens wound up having um, more teachers on the uh, decentralized school system because we were all divided and up here where we're concerned, at least where I live and where Sisto lived and um, where I met him much later when uh, he was then on the slate. Yeah. Uh, and we had palm cards <laughs> uh, and proportional representation came. But I think what happened for many schools and I can speak mostly about District 6, um, is that we had three or four people eventually on the board who were what you would call more status quo and not willing to change an experiment. And then we had a few more. Um, uh, it's uh, got to meet you know, someone like uh, Gwen Crenshaw. And, Dave um, and Tom Marino and in Dave, Dave and Dubnow. Dave, Dave Dubnow. And um, then they said, oh, well, nobody will able, be able to figure out how to vote for these people uh, because in school board elections, um, you didn't have to be a citizen in order to vote. You could vote. You were a member of the community of that district, and you could vote. But if you were a parent of a child in a school up through um, eighth or ninth grade, you know, it had to be middle school and, and below, then you could vote, and then there was this big bugaboo called proportional representation, which everybody is so afraid of, and actually it's really, it's a terrific system 
in order to elect legislative bodies. It's certainly not good to um, elect anyone else. I mean, where you're a governor or a president or so on, but for legislative, because there is a possibility. And so they came to me, they said, Laura, nobody will know how to do proportional representation because it's these two long words. And I said, well, it's the kind of decisions that we make every day. At this point, I was very active in the League of Women Voters. I also had, in 72, we moved to the west side of Broadway uh, and uh, Cabrini Boulevard, where I'm still living, and got, um, I think my son at that point was in fourth or fifth grade, and my daughter was probably first or second when we moved. And so then they both went to 187. So I really got to see all these sides uh, and what was at stake. And there was, as you mentioned in uh, your book and it's been written about elsewhere, uh, there was a concern by many parents at 187 um, that children would be bused in because they were not, 187 was not as crowded as many other schools were in District 6. And um, there was, around a year after it came, a, a big attempt to expand the school to eighth grade. In principle, I like, you know, K through eight schools. I went to a K through eight school, and most of you sitting here, your parents probably went to K through eight schools. And um, because that whole concept of intermediate school uh, comes at a very bad time uh, uh, with kids. Uh, boys and girls certainly mature differently, and the idea of throwing them all together for those, well, I'll let sociologists discuss uh, whether it's a good idea or not. Um, but I've just felt that schools needed to be good for everyone, and uh, as I say, we started giving courses at the League of Women Voters on how to do proportional representation, uh, made easy, and I would go around teaching it in all kinds of places, and we did ballots, and, and um, uh, they said, how are you going to teach it? And it's simple. These are decisions we make every day. You go into an ice cream store, right? And you are dying for chocolate ice cream, but there isn't any. So all right, strawberry is not bad. So all right. And they're out of strawberry. So I said, well, vanilla. And I said, is that a person in this room who doesn't make these decisions every day if they go into a supermarket and they're planning on buying one thing but it's not available and you say so you have a choice and so this is what you do here you have all these people they're all qualified in a certain measure but you think some of them may represent you better than others so you make that your first choice so since I got to know Tom Marino and Gwen Crenshaw very well uh, when then I took off my nonpartisan leak hat and started working to get certain people elected to the school board, then I would go around to the schools and uh, would tell them, all right, so let's say you like Tom Marino, and at that time we'd met Sisto, and that was the second time, not the, not the first slate, the, 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 the next time we had school board elections. Yeah. And uh, gotten to meet him because he would attend um, school board meetings, and Can I you, met him through, yes. Let me just interrupt ask you. Me. Because you spotted him as somebody who was talented very early on. What did you see in him? You're from the German Jewish community on the west side of Broadway, six thousand another part of the neighborhood. Well, because, what did you see in him that was well? First of all, stand out? For, first of all, I never put myself into a specific category. It's not how I was raised at home. It's not the experience I had in school, um, and. I understood it. I was very aware of some of the fear, but I was a very inquisitive and nosy child. And uh, I did a lot of traveling um, uh, before our children came. I had to travel many places um, for my job. And then when I then decided to stay home, my husband and I traveled a lot because for, for his business. So uh, whether it was in Europe or whether it was in the United States, and I just felt this is how you inform yourself. I mean, uh, I just want to briefly jump to something that happened when my son decided not to go to 187 for because the Benson decision had come down, 
and it, it was all right for them to continue into seventh and eighth grade. What this effectively meant is that a school that was integrated, but with a large white population, but still integrated on the west side of Broadway, could have kids in grades K through eight. eight right. So they wouldn't have to send their kids to Eleanor Roosevelt Junior High School, 143, which is on 182nd Street between Audubon, yeah, uh, I was, Audubon. I was, yeah. and it is still there. And um, what I did with Ted at the time, it was just very simple. I said, well, you're in sixth grade, you have to make a decision. Um, and in the, I'd already met Selma Lawrence at 143. I thought she was terrific. And I got involved with other people from Rena and Gwen Crenshaw and I got to meet them all. And I thought this was a much healthier environment. And um, so my son spent, uh, I called up Selma Lawrence. And she already knew me because I'd been involved with 143 for some other children there. And um, he spent a whole day there. And he came home and he said, Mom, they've got a science lab. They have an orchestra. Yes. And, and then I knew that many teachers would have a problem, as they did. <laughs> what happened the first year that 187 <coughs> added the 7th, and I don't remember whether they added the 7th and the 8th, or they did the 7th one year and then the 8th the following. I think that's how it happened, but I'm not 100% sure. And of course, they were not prepared, they were not set up, the school was not set up to have the kinds of things which you do need in junior high school. So um, that made me, I think, persona non grata for a while with the 187 community. Um, and um, you sent your son to a school on the I, other side of Broadway. Well, your son I didn't, I didn't sort of send him there. It was kind of his decision because I felt that he could do it. In the meanwhile, my daughter was there. I still was a dues-paying member of uh, the PTA 187, and, um, and I have thick skin, so I could handle it. Um, and uh, I saw the advantages uh, of both. But my great fear was that teachers would have difficulty, really good teachers, in applying because they were told by the Central Board of Education, this is not legal. So they were afraid if they took the job, they could be out. And then what if they had to find a new school that they would like to have because they had some seniority? Were they going to get it in November or December? I mean, there were a lot of things going on simultaneously. And uh, there, that's really where, in a way, I do have to thank the League, because as I say, I joined in 72. And boy, I talk about techniques training and everything else, um, and trying to keep the peace and know not to throw chairs. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff comes in very handy. And uh, uh, well, because other people enjoy doing it. And I thought, <laughs> I thought the best thing is if we could get a really, a group of people on District 6 who recommended the entire community, because what happens, at least it happened to me, when you get to know other people, you find out they're really not all that different from what you are. And you get to eat really wonderful food, which you never had a chance to before, because everybody has you know variations, and I love it. I mean, it's um, it's the spice of life, as they say. So here's Ted in 143, and um, before I six, you know, three months later, I'm president of uh, 143, and Selma Lawrence comes. And we have a very nice uh, parents association, and she said. We don't have enough instruments. We've got all these kids in the orchestra. And uh, so I called my friends who lived in Inwood and uh, junior high school 52 uh, in Inwood. And uh, I said, could you call the principal and see if there are any instruments? And they particularly needed string instruments. And uh, apparently, they're the first to get wrecked by. Uh, uh, maybe the brass holds up longer or whatever. And, and sure enough, and then my, uh, they had instruments which they did not need because they had reduced the size of their music program. So we got a car, car caravan and we got all, you know, husbands and wives with cars or vans to bring the instruments to uh, 143. So they had their full complement, they had a marvelous orchestra and, and wonderful leader. 
And then I said, you gotta write down every instrument because if 52 needs them back, they have to have them back, you know? I mean, and, uh, and what happened then, my friends such as Tom Marino and I guess Charlie Friedman, who was a PA president at the time, and <laughs> they still lived up there and then they went to work on 52 to make sure that the arts program was there. I mean, I felt it then and I felt it now. This is how children learn. They, they learn through the arts. Uh, and, um, and if you don't have it, uh, then you're missing out on, on uh, something terribly important. And then what we also had were parents' association presidents met from the entire district. And I think that's how I got to meet um, Sista. And um, you knew we'd get, I would get there. Uh, and, uh, and I just liked his willingness to join in and, and meet all these other people and uh, the care that he expressed. And so uh, I guess for the second school board election, I went around again uh, giving the little course. In the meantime, I had other people give it because it isn't so complicated. It just means that you don't put a number next to anyone you don't like because you feel they don't represent you and you do like the others. So that, uh, and there's a chance that three of them might get elected if you number them one, two, three, et cetera. And I'm really sorry that they made that so complicated because I really, unions use proportional representation, Australia uses it, and it would be very healthy if other legislative bodies did because I think that more communities as they are new, particularly in New York, were constantly changing, which is, which is good. Um, that they're represented, because I believe that when people feel they are represented, then they are less likely to act out. And if they feel that nobody appreciates them or considers them the dregs, the newcomers, uh, the illegals, in my house, that's an illegal word. I said, <laughs> they're undocumented. I said, you're on this planet, you can't be illegal. So, uh, but it's, it's just uh, my, my my, my point of view, no, not, not chop liver. And, um, and then, of course, when I moved into Castle Village, the first person who approached me, and who then became a very good friend, um, lived in the next building, was uh, Stanley Michaels. And he became a council member. And we also had names you might remember. Uh, uh, Franz Leichter, uh, state senator, Ed Lehner, state assemblyman. And their, their, their fame was the pooper scooper law. That was the fame of uh, Ed and Franz. And but it was good for the streets. Uh, the streets were, the sidewalks were easier to walk on. And that was the beginning of community boards. And I'd gotten to know Stanley quite well at that point. And he did something new, which hadn't, I don't believe had been in done, in done in any of the community boards. These are the planning boards, not school boards. And so he asked me if I would chair a committee. And I did find something which I told you uh, that uh, to suggest the names. Uh, if you don't know what community planning boards are, half of them are named by the councilman of the district and all of them are appointed by the borough president. And so I had found a copy of a letter that I sent, well this is 1986, the recommendations for the board uh, appointments and I wrote, I signed it as the chair on behalf of the other panel members and some of the names may be familiar. Priscilla Bassett, Gwen Crenshaw, Hernan Mendez, Leah Saxel, the Reverend Frederick Williams, and Elizabeth Wurzberger. Now just by telling you the names you can see that what, what Stanley did in selecting these people was he made sure that the entire community of, in this case, Community Board 12 was selected. And I think we were the first ones to do it and then, uh, because it was, it was his idea. And, uh, and uh, the other thing that happened when I looked at it, I said, what nerve I had by marking them highly qualified and preferred <laughs> <laughs> and qualified and then we had the failed to appear for the interview. Uh, so they didn't get anywhere. And um, so who's on it in 86? Adriano Espaillat. Okay. 
Um, Helen Morick, a name you probably know, she yes. was then on. Actually, we served on a Parents Association presidents uh, up at 98 at one time, and then she was, of course, at Presbyterian Hospital. Um, and then, oh God, there was another name. Uh, well, perhaps it was on a, uh, on a different one. And then I got all these letters from the borough presidents, from Andrew Stein and from Dinkins, and uh, when he was borough president, uh, and a few of them because it was just, well, we had um, William Alisea, Joseph Hintersteiner. These are all, you know, uh, very important names in the community that worked at Maria Luna. Uh, and um, so I think what we, what we succeeded in doing, despite all the strife in District 6 and the problems that I think it was probably at the time when decentralization was over and centralization was back in again, I think we were just at the time when it could have worked, mm. when parent involvement would have been sufficient that it could have made a difference. Instead, we went into a, a direction that I'm very unhappy about in the, in the, the charter school direction. And so, um, so, but this is now up to another generation, uh, not, not, uh, not mine, um, to work on. Although the League has very strong positions on it, and although we are nonpartisan and don't favor candidates, we're very strong on positions on issues, and we're very much opposed the way charters are working out, and thinks it's, it is taking money away from the public schools. and. Uh, and anybody who grew up in Washington Heights, as you have in your book, uh, one immigrant group after another, and what brought them to the top and uh, got them into good jobs, you know, you were the head of the unions and everything else, all right, you didn't, as a child, go through there. It has made such a difference in so many lives, and to take money away or do something really crazy, uh, for example, in, in Newark, a million dollars from Zuckerberg and it all went to consultants? I mean, what children need is money in the classroom and what they don't need are consultants. I mean, once they are, have diplomas and working, then and successful and then unemployed, then they can become consultants. But you don't start by spending a million dollars and... Um, I think it was a hundred million. <laughs> Before, you know, we're gonna, we, we have until eight o'clock, I wanna give Sixto a question too, to talk about what you learned and accomplished in your years working around the schools, in the schools and on that term that you did on the school boards. What did you learn from that? What did you accomplish in that, do you think? Wow. <clears throat> well, my first accomplishment was that I learned uh, uh, to negotiate the system, which is kind of complicated for me as an immigrant. I mean, I, I, I became involved in the system because my first experience was after having uh, my two girls and at school age, uh, my wife went to register Roxanne for the, for the kindergarten and the first thing they told her that she's going to be in bilingual class. And I came home, my wife was very happy about it, and I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, she was put in a bilingual class. I said, why? And she says, well, because she needs to learn Spanish. She needs to learn Spanish. I said, so we had a, a discussion, a home discussion. <laughs> and, and I said, well, wait a minute. You, you speak, my wife was more educated than me. So I said, you speak very good Spanish. I, I am really a peasant. I don't speak too good to Spanish. But that is our job, to make sure that she, she learns Spanish at home. She's not going to school to learn Spanish. She's going to school because she was born in this country. And I, I, I may sound now, and I sounded then, uh, a fight, uh, you know, uh, a little arrogant about it, but the fact is that I saw the future of my daughter. I don't want. I didn't want my daughter to be excluded by the virtue of or having learned to be put on, on a bilingual class 
uh, because everything that I have learned from bilingual class that the children were neglected. They, they were not learning anything. So I said, no, she's going to, uh, she's going to, a, to a monolingual class. So, of course, the next day I came to school and I used to work nights. I came to school and um, and uh, I went to talk to Miss Miss forgot her name uh, and I said I want my daughter in uh, monolingual class. I don't want my daughter in bilingual class. Why? I said because she's American. She needs to learn English. I want her to learn English, and we're going to take her Spanish at home. So. Uh, it was a big thing. Well, you have to. You, she gave me all the reason why not to. And I said, I'm sorry. That's my daughter, and she's going to monolingual class. Well, you have to sign a waiver. I said, sign a waiver for what? Well, you you need to sign a waiver that she's going to monolingual class. I said, I sign on whatever you want. He said, well, you have to also have to speak to the principal. So I went to see Mr. Coleman, and Mr. Coleman says, of course, you can send your daughter to. You can do with your daughter whatever you want. My daughter was next week, she was in a monolingual class. The point was, and I learned that then I got in trouble because I was, I was looked at as uh, strange. Being a Hispanic, that do not want her daughter to be, so I was stigmatized by, by my decision to have my daughter in, and the, t the teachers would look at me and the, 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 uh, struct the bilingual structure within the school were looking at me as strange and I said, I don't know. I, I mean, I wasn't paying too much attention to it, but but then eventually I became PA president. Uh, but which school? Was 173, PS 173. So eventually, the I became a parents association president, and a lot of teacher was suspicious about me in terms of my activism, in in terms of that, and uh, I guess the word got around. But we had. I I tell you what. I had a. I had a beautiful experience uh, with the teachers in 173. Uh, number one, they were well qualified. They were still really good teachers then. I don't know. I don't. I, I have questions about what's going on today. But the, the quality of teaching then, I remember my daughter going to a classroom, a reading classroom, and she was in school like three weeks and she was already reading. She came home reading. I said, "Wow!" and those people, I know one of those ladies live in my, in my neighborhood. She's, she's still there. They, 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 are, they were dedicated to, you know, those are the things that I admire for the system. So I got elected, I got elected to the school board, to the, uh, to the PA, because there was a lot of um, animosity, a lot of conflicts, uh, a lot of problems, overcrowding. Uh, the lunchroom situation, oh my God. There was a... There was a, the lunch started in PS 173 started at 10 o'clock, the lunch the lunch hour. In other words, the children went into class at 8 o'clock, and they were already having lunch at 10 o'clock. And so people began to talk to me. A lot of professional teachers who were concerned, and professional people within the school started talking about it. And I said, "Well, what's going on?" He said, "Well, they will have no space." So. We, we had a, such a great parent association. We had so many great people in the parent association. I, I mean, I didn't know anything about parent association. I didn't know anything about organization. I didn't know anything about the school system. I had no knowledge of what was going on. But as a person who has some experience at General Motors working in, within the union, fighting against racism and discrimination and like, against uh, all kinds of working condition and I realized that we have to do something. So we got together and we sat down and we, we created a plan and we got elected and and we got the uh, Stanley Michael and the school was, uh, they built a new, they told us that we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that, that the, that the building, the school building uh, division was not going to build another addition to the school and I said, uh, well, okay, so I have Sonia Morales, Carmen Galindez, who were like uh, firecrackers. They, they would not take no for an answer. And some of the, some of the Virginia, Virginia Torres, we have so many great women. I was the only man and the whole, I was the figurehead president because they were running the show. I was, I was 
I didn't know anything. I was just, I just happened to know a little English and a little Spanish, and I was able to communicate with the parents and create a kind of relationship. And my God, Mr. Coleman, Mr. Coleman said, go, go for it, go for it, go for it. Mr. Coleman never said, don't do it. This is the way you gotta do it. He was so supportive of us, and I really have a great admiration for him because he said, if you really decide this is what you wanna do, go for it. And we did it. And Stalin Michael got, I think it was uh, $10 million to al allocate it to- yeah, not, not that much. Th not much? No. For, that, for that school, for that win? That, that, Close to a thing. Huh? Yeah, maybe six or seven. Six, okay, I thought it was 10. Anyway, it looked like 10 then. <laughs> it looked like 100. So they built a new win where the, 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 uh, the, they said, well, you can't do that because the subway, the train is down there, and you can't do that because this is the yard, you're gonna take part of the yard. I said, well, you know, if we have to use the yard for the kids to eat, then let's, let's build a win and build a classroom and create a, a cafeteria down there on the first floor. And that's it, that's what happened. It happened, uh, it happened so soon, it was, it, was a, it was the greatest achievement. Our achievement, not mine, but the achievement of the Parents Association. When was this? 1980? No, no, later. Later? Yeah, it was later than that. Late, late, late I, I, okay, so so it was when I was a member of the school board and then it was uh, erected. Yeah, you were president of the Parents Association. Yeah, twice. School, yeah, right? for two years, for three years. I mean, we have such a great group that I, I didn't have to do anything, just be there. <laughs> yeah. And you have those women, they get, they, I used to work days I, because my job changes based on my seniority. So sometimes I had to go, I was forced to go nights and I had the choice to go, sometimes I had the choice to go nights, but at that time it was kind of forced to go uh, nights. Uh, I would do the duties of the day, during the day, and they would do the duties at the night. They, at night time, they would they all go, different committees would go to the school board, another group would go to the central board, the other group would go to the hearings, and the other group was going to the, uh, to the school um, division of building, whatever. And the next day, we all called each other, this was what's going on, it's very exciting, Stanley Michael was with us, and, and blah, blah, blah. And we all celebrated, and then we cook, and then we ate, and then we ate, and we fed the whole building. So one of the greatest things that we did was that we changed the mentality of the of the teachers and the in the uh, faculty. They were kind of suspicious of of us. So what we did was we established where we had to have lunch once a year. We would sit down with them and have lunch. We serve them whatever we want. They want. We cook. And they would love it. They were so happy about that. And and you know the, because oh because the decision was to create a parent association, not as a PTA but a PA, and they kind of uh, didn't like that. So I said, well, this is what we want to be. We want to be a parent association because we have a, the history before us. It was influenced by the teacher and everything. And sometimes politics, uh, you know, plays a role in the kind of relationship. The principal and the teachers. They all, they belong to different, same, same kind of, uh, they belong to their own union and they, they have an agenda and we wanted to have our own agenda. And we were successful in that, to that extent. I want to open up to the group to ask questions. Um, just to close with two thoughts about why I think that the memories that both Laura and Sixto bear are so important. Today when public schools, integration in public schools are much on the agenda. Yes. It's often discussed without any kind of historical perspective whatsoever, of two kinds. It doesn't take into account the huge, dynamic, multifaceted civil rights movement yep. in New York City of the mm -hmm. 50s, which preceded everything that happened in the 60s. And unless you have that sense of what people were trying to do in the 50s, you have no sense of scale that the formulas that are talked about today are smaller, they don't get at the full dimensions of the problem, and they don't get at the full dimensions of the solution. The other thing that helps is to know that both Laura and Sixto are sharing stories that come out of a neighborhood where, in fact, polarization and conflict were, were, were common themes. And yet what you see them is working sometimes together, sometimes in complementary ways, that brought people together to improve publication, public schools, public education, in ways in which parents, teachers, and sometimes principals 
could push for common goals. This is frankly news in the history of public education in large parts in New York City in the 1970s. I want to open to questions about this in one second, but I was, I was just struck the way the things that you said resonated with a, a clipping that I found when I was researching the history of education in northern Manhattan. And a woman named Hope Irvine, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, who was a teacher and active on Community Board 12, wrote an op-ed for a local newspaper. And it read this way. The riches of our neighborhoods are the people who make time to build bridges of understanding who find ways to bring people together in relaxed, non-threatening ways, who find ways to bring people together, who work towards a strong and more cohesive community, which draws its strength from our rich mixture of cultural heritage. When we share our arts, our food, our fun, we can find each other. When we can share our sh cares and concerns, we can trust each other. When we work together for each other, we can love each other. Yes. Leave that thought and now open up the questions. So my name is uh, Al Kerland. Um, I moved into Washington Heights in uh, 1976, when most people of my uh, Caucasian persuasion were running from Washington Heights. But uh, during that time, I had the good fortune to meet the Joe Rothschilds of the world and, the, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Simon and, and Dave Quinshaw, you know, uh, Gwen's son, yes. became very actively involved in youth organizing, youth work in, in Washington Heights. So one of the things I strike through, you know, each of you talked about isolation and, and uh, lack of participation and, and power, is that the representation of girls, for girls in the public school system, even, even though girls in, in the public school system are systematically excluded in many ways from the benefit of public education, for years, I could not even participate in the PSAL. I think it only became legal maybe in the 1970s. Just to say there's a school to prison pipeline. There was a, a, a lack of a pipeline for girls for math or science. So systematically excluded from many of the benefits of public education, which really impacted uh, significantly, especially in our, our neighborhood with black and Latinas. Yet through my entire experience with Community School District 6 and the power structures for people running that school system, except for one woman whose name I can't quote right now, we never had a female community superintendent. I think we had one. And District 6? In District 6. Loyola Fire. She was the one, right? Other than that, all male. So I was just curious about what your thoughts were about that and, and your participation, each of you, in, in trying to get uh, young, young women and women more involved in making public school education more equitable for females. Well, I tell you, um, I've been thinking about that from my, my socioeconomic background, my, my, and my race and ethnicity. And the possibility that I've been able to break through and, and be what I am today, and, and I have six sisters, and my mother, everybody in my mother and my family are female, so I have I bring I bring a, a lot of experience dealing with women, and I have two daughters, and so every, everybody around me are women, and four granddaughters, so <laughs> four, yeah, they were represented in my family, so one of the things that I learned in my life. Uh, by my ex all of my experiences is that society uh, try to dissect us in different categories in different boxes they put the black people in one in one box the Spanish one the, the immigrant another the and everybody and the women and one another so we all we all fall into that trap we all fall into the trap to to be content with that kind of setting and if we don't do something to change that, then we're going to be victim. We're going to be our own slave, our, our own, our, our own uh, setting. And that's one of the things that I, I realized, uh, thinking about that every time you see some something, every time you're doing something positive, something constructive, somebody is going to criticize it for whatever reason, 
and most of the time the reason is makes no sense. Just because people are getting together. I mean, take the gay issue. Uh, the the uh, you know it's, it, it has no it has no it has no no bearing on on us for us to judge what two people wants to do. So they they use that in order to separate people. So that's what I like. I mean, coming from a Dominican perspective, and who are very macho oriented, uh, male dominated society, I had to I had to learn all those things, and I had to I had to come in and 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 uh, confront that that reality. Because inclusive when I when I went to North Carolina to the to the uh, to the job court, that I was exposed to the black community. All the all my friends were black because I could not be with a white. So what did you do to keep it constructive? I joined them and I, I played them and I and I and I play and and I, I made them feel that I was part of them. I was not insulting them. I was I was we we we, we joined for game, we would go out picnic we go out uh, in, in in the in the classroom. I mean we were together in the classroom but at least we were if we, in the time off from, from the camp we went uh, camping up in the mountain, and we have Mexican, white, black. We have all of them. We have we have really had a group of people working together. So I learned that from that. My experience comes from that. We cannot allow society or the the power the powers of society to tell us how how where to be, or, or how to who or who we should accept or reject. And so, in terms of the women, this is a part of the problem. We we are we are we always you know the, the situation with women right now. Is they don't get enough. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying anything new. They're not getting paid what they deserve. The same I get paid. So why not? So what are we doing about it? I mean, you know, it's it's, it's crazy what's going on. So my point is, those are real issues that we need to be together about it. So unity creates those changes. Unity creates the understanding and the reality that we need to we need to work together through those ends. So that's my experience. To answer your question about women, well when I went to 187 it was a very strong woman principle, excellent principle. And um, 143 Selma Lawrence and then I knew, I guess it was Lorraine Allison, who I met through the league, and she was supervisor, principals, uh, I believe, in Queens. Um, so I saw very strong women. Um, I think at the moment, it's probably still sometimes a cultural thing that particularly families that have come here, more recent, more recent immigrants, that there's still a tendency toward this is what girls do, and this is what boys do, and whether you, whether they're aware of it or not, um, I think it does have an effect. But otherwise, it's for the people who make the policy. You know, the decision of who is going to be the representative, you know, et cetera, a little bit of thought, a little bit of waking up. Um, in my case, and for the many years, that we had the annex in 98. I think ultimately it was very good for me. Years later, my uh, uh, father said, Laura, there's no living with you in your years. You know, you had to be the head of the math club, and you had to be the editor of the, uh, the Cherry Branch, and you had to be this. And then uh, another friend of mine who became very big in advertising, and she went off in other fields. So I think. I think it's still basically in our society the natural thing for parents, in most cases, you can, can't generalize, to expect certain things from boys and certain things from girls, and there we have it. Uh, I think there's been a change. Some has to be done legally, such as Title IX, and you have to get people to obey it. And some has, has to be because people who are making decisions, whether they're in boardrooms or in, in education or in civic organizations, is if it's all male dominated, then what are we doing wrong? Uh, and that's why I think the teaching staff has to also represent 
the students, but it doesn't always happen right away. Because if you expect a child to follow a, a certain direction and all they see are people who do not look like them or talk like them, it happens then the following generation. I mean, I love what's going on in the world right now. All the people who are immigrants would like to build walls. Excuse me, <laughs> you know? Um, I think I could probably find your name at Ellis Island. I'm not you, but you know, your grandfather. And, and so on. Um, so until I think they come from the moon, I'm going to, you know, when they arrive. Well, no, we know there's nobody living on the moon. Mars, perhaps. <laughs> um, so I think we just have to be a little bit more honest and um, perhaps judge ourselves a little harsher and be open to uh, listening to other points of view and then finding out, um, well, what was that wonderful expression by Will Rogers? You know, you put up your pants one leg at a time. So there you go. And women, you know, wear pants now too, I remember. <laughs> right. Does someone have a question that helps us get at the relationship between activism and schools issues today in particular? You're, you're very clear about in the 1950s and early 60s, back to the 40s, 60s, et cetera, that many officials in New York, many, many of the people in charge of the Democratic Party, the school system, did not want to recognize race as an issue. They, they did not want to recognize difference. And that even carries through, you can go into the Koch administration when there's a certain kind of attitude about why can't they all be like? Right. Why can't blacks be like the Jews were? We, they're all the same. They're all the same. And indeed, you, you, you both, you, both of the participants have at various times, you said, I don't consider myself uh, in, in that as, as a something I consider myself more cosmopolitan or mm -hmm. a, a and then you don't want to be in a box. So some of that still lingers on. But the reality reality in Washington Heights was that everything was not alike. And so that rights were not distributed evenly. You know, the idea that everybody is created equal, everybody's the same. When it actually played out in the neighborhood, yes. people were not treated the same. They were not the same. There, you, you, there has to be a recognition of this difference, which is the, the thing we're talking about now in terms of women. There has to be a recognition of the difference. But there also has to be a recognition of a similarity. And that old model about everybody being alike can't really speak to the neighborhood. But we haven't really figured out a new model of a general proposition that encompasses the diversity. You know, multiculturalism is tossed around, but it doesn't even mean the same thing. You know, as the white sub man does in terms of, you know, of pushing forward on things. And so, the, you know, the importance I felt when I read, read the book, the importance of, of, of what's happening now, what's going on, is this recognition of difference and a willingness to work while recognizing those differences. That you're not demanding that people be like me. You're not demanding that this community be like the other community. There's recognition that the historical uh, phenomena are different. The histories are different. That people come to the table as different people. Now, they might have difficulty working on an agreement because of that, but they don't come with an idea that we're all alike. Yeah. The, the, but I, you know, May I say something? Oh, sure, no, please. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I'm so sad that just at the point where decentralization was beginning to work, after some horrendous things going on, but nobody with contracts and all kinds of things were wrong, uh, and legally, but exactly what you say, because we had everyone represented on that school board, uh, every religion, every race, every color, and then suddenly the parents would then come out more. And they would say, well, there's somebody who looks like me and who went through what I went, either an immigrant experience or a language uh, thing and that was different. And, and now we have these 
councils, which nobody pays much attention to. And we had many years of, um, well, uh, a, a whole nine years or more, I, I guess, where schools became more factories and of what they were supposed to do. And all the decisions, again, um, were sort of made by the mayor. And even before, there was mayoral control. Um, so I'm kind of sad about that, because I think that it would have eventually worked with proper controls on contracts and so that people couldn't financially uh, do what, what they got away with. And, um, but I think you need to see people who look like you in all walks of life. So I, was, I was struck by when you talked about proportional representation. Mm -hmm. I worked under a system at one time of proportional representation. And it's wonderful. Isn't it fun? It's really wonderful. <laughs> and that is a way in which you assure that there is diversity. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, and then when people are forced to work together, and then they can do a much better job. I mean, if it hadn't been for my experience with um, working with 143, I probably wouldn't have met Gwen Crenshaw, who became uh, you know, a, a dear, dear friend. I mean, just an amazing woman. And, and there were several others, the whole RENA organization. And I got them to meet people. And they eventually decided that they could teach proportional representation also, that it wasn't that complicated. It was just like going to Baskin Robbins. That's not what we used to call it. I moved to the neighborhood in 1986, and then we had a child in 1990, and in a gay family. And um, <coughs> I learned about the Dominican community's effort to exert some political power around the school system by really leveraging the right that every parent had to vote for the school board. And that the people who emerged through that movement became first Dominican city councilman, mm -hmm. first Dominican assembly person, first Dominican senator. So all this has now changed mm -hmm. somewhat, but it really made me think about, and I have been involved at various points on this issue, why is it that not everyone who lives in New York City gets to vote for the mayor, whether or not they're a citizen, because it was so dramatic with the school systems where the voters didn't have kids in those schools, and the people in those schools couldn't get buildings built. And they found a way through this loophole that parents got to vote regardless. And I think that it would be a very interesting city government if everybody who is in the city who's affected by the city government got to vote on who ran the city government. So that, I think, is just a fascinating insight that that movement showed to me. And I think would change education and a lot of other things. Thank you. I want to thank everybody. We can talk more informally for a long time into the night. Thank you. <laughs>